Father in heaven, thank you for the wonderful food that we've been able to enjoy. Thank you, Father, for your bountiful blessings to us. What a joy it is to be alive. What a joy it is to be your children. And to know that very, very soon we will be in the kingdom with you. Not for a while, but forever. How we look forward to that day. But we realize that we have a desert to cross first. We have many trials ahead. And we need to have the faith of Jesus. So we ask that as we study this afternoon about the importance of your Holy Sabbath, the relationship that it has with events that are happening in the world today, that your Holy Spirit will be with us to keep us awake and alert and to help us see the times that we're living in so that we might remain firm in the crisis ahead. And we thank you for hearing our prayer. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. In Revelation chapter 14, by the way, all of the talks that I'm presenting here are related to the three angels' message. I don't know whether you've noticed that. Last night we studied about the three angels that came to Abraham. Uh, this morning in our first subject we dealt about the crisis ahead over the beast, his image, and his mark. Uh, this morning we dealt with the Sabbath, and we're going to notice that's in the first angels' message. Uh, now we're going to talk about the contemporary papacy, the Jesuits, and the Sabbath. In our last subject, we're going to take a look at the hour of God's judgment. So all of the presentations are relating to the first angel's message. Let's just read the first angel's message in Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God, and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. And now comes the phrase that we're going to dwell on, and worship Him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and springs of water. So the first angel's message attracts our attention to the Creator and the Sabbath, which is the sign of the Creator. So the first angel's message calls the world to worship the Lord and to show that worship through the observance of the Sabbath. So in order to understand what we're going to study in the first angel's message, we need to go back to the creation story. Because if the first angel's message says worship the one who made heaven, earth, the sea, and springs of water, we have to go back to where God did that we have to go back to the book of Genesis. Now there's one thing that is absolutely clear in Genesis, and there are other things, but the thing that I'm going to emphasize is that the days of creation were literal days of 24 hour e hours each, just like we know days to be now. They were not long periods of time, they were literal 24 hour days. What evidence do we have of this? Let me go through several evidences that clearly indicate that the days of creation were literal 24-hour days. First of all, when we examine the Hebrew lexicons, the lexicons are the dictionaries that define words, the, all of the dictionaries, the reputable ones of the scholars, tell us that the word day as it is found in the Genesis account means a literal day of 24 hours. Now they might argue whether, whether Moses was right in saying that they were 24 hour days, like I was mentioning this morning. However, in their minds, in the minds of those who define Hebrew words, there is no doubt whatsoever that the word day in the Genesis account means a 24 hour day. So the dictionaries or the lexicons make it very clear that the days of creation were literal days. The second argument is that each day has a numeral qualifier. It was the evening and the morning of the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, and so on, seventh day. So the word day has a number, a numeral qualifier. Every single time in the Old Testament that the word day appears with a numeral qualifier, it's a 24-hour day. 
No exceptions from the Old Testament. So clearly, if every other reference the word day means 24 hour day, we must understand that in Genesis when the word day is attached to a numeral qualifier, it must mean a literal 24 hour day. The third evidence is the expression evening and morning. It would be absolutely absurd to say it was the evening and morning of the first billion years. Evening and morning clearly is marked by the rising and setting of the sun. The evening is when the sun sets, the morning is when the sun rises. So the expression evening and morning clearly indicates literal days of the rising and the setting of the sun. A further evidence is found in Psalm 33 and verse 9. There you have the language of immediacy, of quickness. It says there God spoke and it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. There's no indication, you know, that, that it would say God spoke and it took millions of years to be done and God commanded and by a long process of evolution it came into existence. No, the language is language of immediacy. It says God spoke, it was done. He commanded and it stood fast. Another indication in the creation story that the days of creation were literal days is the expression, and it was so. It's used four times in the creation story. Once again, it's language of immediacy, something that happens quickly. The expression, and it was so. The next evidence that we find in the story of creation that the creation story is referring to literal 24 hour days, and this is the most powerful argument of all, is the fourth commandment of God's law. God says to Israel and to all of humanity, because all of the commandments apply to everyone, not only to the Jews, although the Christian world says, well the Sabbath applies to the Jews, the rest of them are for us. But really all of them, even though they were given to the Jews, because the Jews were God's people at that time, it doesn't mean that they were exclusively for the Jews. And so the fourth commandment says, God, God tells us, we are supposed to work six and rest the seventh because God worked six and rested the seventh. How could we follow God's example of working six and resting the seventh is that the, if the days of creation were millions of years long? Are you understanding me? The fact that God says, you work six days and rest the seventh like I worked six days and rest the seventh, seventh indicates that the days of creation were literal 24 hour days like the days that we know today. Another clear indication that the days of creation were literal and the story of creation in general is literal is the fact that the New Testament writers confirm very clearly that the creation story literally took place as the Bible says. Does for example the Apostle Paul say that God created the first Adam? Absolutely. Does the Apostle Paul mention the temptation of Eve? Absolutely, in 1 Timothy chapter 2. Furthermore, did Jesus confirm that at the beginning God married the man and the woman? You can go. To, uh, to Matthew chapter 19 verses 4 through 6, he who made them in the beginning made them male and female, it says there. So very clearly Jesus and the apostles believed that the story of creation was a literal story and therefore the days of creation must have been literal days. Furthermore, the spirit of prophecy is absolutely clear that the days of creation were literal days. In the book Spirit of Prophecy, volume 1, page 85, Ellen White wrote this, I was then carried back to the creation, this is happening in vision, and was shown that the first week in which God performed the work of creation in six days and rested on the seventh was just like every other week. The great God in his days of creation and day of rest, measured off the first cycle 
as a sample for successive weeks till the close of time. So the week today is the same week of creation. The week has never been interrupted. You know, I find it very interesting that Christians, and this is kind of a sidelight, you know that the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of the times of Christ. Because we say Christ went to the synagogue, as was his custom on the Sabbath day. They say, how do you know that the Sabbath day today is the same Sabbath day back then? And I answer by asking a question. I say, which day of the week do you keep as the day of rest? Well, I keep Sunday. I say, why do you keep Sunday? Well, because Jesus resurrected on Sunday. So I say, so you're telling me that you keep Sunday today because Jesus resurrected on Sunday, the same day today. Well, if Sunday today is the same day, the Sabbath is also the same day. And then somebody will come up and say, now wait a minute. How do you know that the Sabbath of Christ's day was the same Sabbath of creation? And my answer is very simple. Jesus created the Sabbath and he would not have kept the wrong day. So the Sabbath today is the same Sabbath of creation. The days were literal days of 24 hours. In fact, in another statement, Testimonies to Ministers, page 135, Ellen White wrote, When the Lord declares that he made the world in six days and rested on the seventh day, he means the day of 24 hours which he has marked off by the rising and setting of the sun. Now nothing could be clearer than that. She's saying, he means the day of 24 hours, which he has marked off by the rising and the setting of the sun. The last evidence that I would like to provide is that there are still some individuals, some scholars out there, that believe that the days of creation were literal days outside the Adventist church. For example, Henry Morris, staunch creationist, passed away a few years ago, wrote a book uh, called Biblical Creationism. On page 62 he wrote this, The Lord himself had worked six days, then rested on the seventh, setting thereby a permanent pattern for the benefit of mankind. Clearly the days of creation were literal days. And yet Ellen White, Ellen White in her day also understood that there were individuals, uh, very educated individuals, both in the scientific world and in the theological world, that would try to accommodate the biblical story of creation with science, so-called. Let me read you this statement from the book Education, page 128 and 129. She wrote, Inferences erroneously drawn from facts observed in nature have, however, led to a supposed conflict between science and revelation. And in the effort to restore harmony, interpretations of scripture have been adopted that undermine and destroy the force of the word of God. Geology has been thought to contradict the literal interpretation of the mosaic record of creation. Millions of years, it is claimed, were required for the evolution of the earth from chaos. And now notice this, and in order to accommodate the Bible to this supposed revelation of science, the days of creation are assumed to have been vast indefinite periods covering thousands or mil even millions of years, and then she says such a conclusion is wholly uncalled for. The Bible record is in harmony with itself and with the teaching of nature. So you can observe nature and you can say, well, you know, nature contradicts the Bible, so we have to accommodate the Bible to, na to nature or to science. But when you study science from the correct and proper perspective, science is in harmony with Scripture. It does not contradict Scripture. So we have abundant evidence that the days of creation were literal days, and we can accept the story of creation literally. However, and unfortunately, two of the greatest, most contemporary popes of the Roman Catholic Church, 
beg to differ from what the Bible says. John Paul II, neither Francis I, actually believe, of course John Paul is dead, that the creation story literally took place as the Bible says. In fact, both of them believed in the Big Bang as the origin of the universe. And they believed that the days of creation represent or symbolize vast periods of time composed of millions of years. I want to read you a statement from John Paul II. This is a speech that he, that he gave to the Papal Academy of the Sciences. And uh, he's referring here to an encyclical that was written by Pope Pius XII. The name of the encyclical is Humane Generis, in other words, the origin of man. Uh, he wrote this in 1950. At that time, the Roman Catholic uh, Church was transitioning, the scholarly world in the Roman Catholic Church was transitioning from a belief in creation to a belief in evolution. Because many uh, Roman Catholic scientists have, con have come to the conclusion that the days of creation were vast periods of time and they could not be reconciled as literal days with what science was revealing to them. And so he's referring here to this encyclical of Pope Pius XII who at that time was for the first time willing to embrace the idea of evolution. He said as long as the Roman Catholic Church believed that once evolution reached a certain stage and you have a, had a very well advanced ape that God gave that ape a soul that made the ape into a human being. But the idea was that evolution took millions of years in the mind of John Paul II. Let me read you his statement that he gave to the Papal Academy of the Sciences. Today, almost a half century after, pub after the publication of the encyclical, and I've re I already told you what the encyclical says, John Paul wrote, new knowledge has led to the recognition of the theory of evolution as more than a hypothesis. So what he's saying is new knowledge, since the encyclical was written in 1950, he says, has given the recognition that the theory of evolution is more than a hypothesis. He continued writing, it is indeed remarkable that this theory has been progressively accepted by researchers following a series of discoveries in various fields of knowledge. The convergence in other words, of all these different studies, the convergence, neither sought nor fabricated, of the results of work that was conducted independently is in itself a significant argument in favor of the theory. Let me read you what uh, a staff writer for the Chicago Tribune wrote about this speech that the Pope gave, Pope John Paul II. In a major statement of the Roman Catholic Church's position on the theory of evolution, Pope John Paul II has proclaimed that the theory is more than just a hypothesis and that evolution is compatible with the Christian faith. In a written message to the Pontifical Academy of Sciences, the Pope said the theory of evolution has been buttressed by scientific studies and discoveries since Charles Darwin. And then, of course, the writer of this column, he's going to immediately mention the obvious, and that is that the biblical record cannot reconcile with the idea that John Paul II held. He wrote, if taken literally, the biblical view of the beginning of life and Darwin's scientific view would seem irreconcilable. In Genesis, the creation of the world and Adam, the first human, took six days. Evolution's process of genetic mutation and natural selection, the survival and proliferation of the fittest new species, has taken billions of years, according to scientists. So he's saying the view that John Paul II is embracing and the biblical view are irreconcilable. He's being honest. They cannot be reconciled. Now Pope Francis the first, 
was even more explicit because Pope Francis uh, wrote that uh, the universe came into existence through the Big Bang. Let me read you what he said. The Big Bang, which today we hold, not me, him, in the Roman Catholic Church, the Big Bang, which today we hold to be the origin of the world, hmm, does not contradict the intervention of the divine creator, but rather requires it. Evolution in nature is not inconsistent with the notion of creation, because evolution requires the creation of beings that evolve. You know, as God made the first blurb of life, and he incorporated into that all of the mechanism that would allow it to evolve in the course of millions of years until we're here. So he says they're not incompatible. And then he wrote this blasphemous statement. When we read about creation in Genesis, we run the risk of imagining God as a magician with a magic wand able to do everything. But that is not so. That's Pope Francis I. So both of the most uh, famous popes in the last 40 years, close to 50 years, have gone on the record saying that we cannot trust the Genesis account. In fact, uh, Pope Francis I in his encyclical on the environment, Laudato Si, says that the story of creation is a symbolic story that has the purpose of teaching truths, but it cannot be taken literally. Now, of course, that makes you wonder how the Pope could encourage people to take care of the planet because of climate change. That's somewhat contradictory to the point of view of evolution, as we're going to see. Now this theory that is held by the Roman Catholic Church and many Protestants are following suit, particularly the liberal Protestant churches like the United Methodist, the United Presbyterian, the United Lutheran, the United Church of Christ, are following suit, many of their scholars, the intelligentsia, if you please, they have studied these scientific discoveries and they say, well, you know, you can't reconcile the, the Bible with the scientific discoveries, so because science is more contemporary, we can trust science more than what we can trust the Bible, is what they're saying. Even in Protestant circles, the Adventist Church is one of the few remaining churches that actually teaches in its doctrinal statements that Creation took place during seven literal 24-hour days. The implications of not believing that the days were literal are astounding and dangerous. I mentioned some of them this morning. The Bible tells us very clearly in Genesis chapter 2 that God created Adam, then from Adam God took Eve, and then God performed the first marriage. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined unto his wife. The creation story tells us that marriage is heterosexual. Marriage is between a man and a woman. That's the biblical definition of marriage, but it all depends on whether you believe in the literal story of creation or not. Because if evolution is the origin of human beings, there's no foundation or basis for saying that marriage should be between a man and a woman. Are you understanding me? Did God clearly establish gender in the story of Genesis? Yes, He did. It says that He created them male and female. There was no such thing as 50 or 60 different genders, like people say today. God created male and female. But if you believe in the theory of evolution, the result is that the foundation of the distinction of gender disappears. So society today, what, they, what they've done is because they've gone astray from the Bible, they implement all kinds of different types of marriage and different types of gender because they don't accept the authoritative record that we find in the book of Genesis. But it gets even more serious. Does the observance of the Sabbath depend on the creation story? 
six days of labor and the seventh day as a day of rest. Absolutely. But what happens if you believe that creation took place over the course of millions of years? The Sabbath disappears. There is no foundation and no basis for the Sabbath. And by the way, it's very interesting that the two creation institutions that God established, which is marriage and the Sabbath, both of those institutions are an illustration of the relationship between God and His people. Is marriage, uh, is marriage an illustration or a metaphor of the relationship between God and His people? Absolutely. Is the Sabbath an illustration of the relationship between God and His people? Of course. So what has Satan done? He's done his utmost to destroy the two creation institutions because they point to the relationship between God and His people. And you know, I find it interesting, many evangelical churches, at least in the United States, oh, they're fighting tooth and nail to defend traditional marriage. I was once talking to one of these individuals who believes that marriage should be between a man and a woman, conservative Protestants. And I, and I said to him, just to be facetious, but I appeared to be sincere because I wasn't trying to make a point, I said, uh, you know, he asked me, he says, do you believe that in homosexual marriage, do you think a man can marry a man and a woman a woman? I said, of course I do. I don't, by the way. And he looked at me, his eyes got big because he knew I was Seventh-day Adventist. He says, what? You believe that it's okay for a man to marry a man and a woman a woman? I said, of course. He says, but, but what do you do? The, 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 clearly the book of Genesis says, says that God married a man and a woman. And then I had him where I wanted to ha have him. I said to him, and what else did God establish in Genesis? He says, what do you mean? I said, God instituted marriage before sin in Genesis, but he also instituted the Sabbath before sin. So why do you pick and choose and say, well, we need to reestablish marriage between man and a woman because God made it so at the beginning, but you say that we don't do the same with the Sabbath. It's either all or nothing. And if I might meddle a little bit, a little bit you, know, you know what else God established at creation? He established a vegetarian diet. So as Adventists we say, we need to restore the Sabbath because God made it at creation. We need to safeguard marriage between a man and a woman. God made it at creation. But when it comes to practicing health, we say, that doesn't apply. God wants us in these last days to restore all creation institutions. He wants us to go not to a plan B, He wants us to go to a plan A. Yes, God allowed us to eat flesh, allowed Israel to eat flesh foods after sin, after they had gone through the desert, or during the time that they were going through the desert, yes. But at the beginning it was not so. You remember that the Pharisees came to Jesus and they said, is it all right, all right for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? And Jesus said, no. It can only happen in case of adultery of one of the two. And they said, well, why, didn't then, why then did Moses allow us to give a letter of divorce for any reason? And Jesus said, because of the hardness of your hearts. But at the beginning it was not so. The standard for Adventists is not a plan B. The standard for Adventists is plan A. Reinstitute everything that God established at creation. Furthermore, the, perceptive, the perception of these popes totally contradicts their evolutionary theory. You know on what basis evolution functions? It functions on the basis of the survival of the fittest, called also natural selection. The strong survive and the weak disappear. That's the theory of evolution. That doesn't fit with what the Pope is teaching. The Pope is saying, oh, the rich, they need to take their money and give it to the poor. The nations, they need to receive all of the immigrants into their nation to help the poor. That doesn't square with the theory that he believes in. Because if he follows his own theory, the rich, what they should do is trample on the poor because the poor are weak and the rich are strong. I'm not saying that that's what we should do. But that's what his theory teaches. 
Furthermore, and here's a very important point, if it took millions and millions of years for the evolutionary process to take place, and by the way, the process has not concluded yet because we're still extremely imperfect in the process, how much longer do we have to wait for the process to be complete? Furthermore, here's something else. How long will it take God to make a new heavens and a new earth? Must we wait again millions and billions of years for God to make a new heavens and a new earth by using the mechanism of evolution? Listen folks, the papacy does not believe that the great hope of the world is the second coming of Jesus Christ. How many of you ever have heard Pope Francis I referring to the second coming as the solution to all human problems? You will not hear it. Because the papacy's idea is that you will have a theocracy like the papacy had during the 1260 years. The papacy will take control of the civil powers of the world, implement her agenda, and as a result you'll have a golden ideal society where everybody lives at peace. That has been tried before during the 1260 years and there was no peace. But the idea of the Roman Catholic Church is a theocracy taking over the world by joining church and state. It's not a glorious supernatural second coming of Jesus Christ from heaven to establish His everlasting kingdom on this earth. That is not the perspective of the Roman Catholic Church. Furthermore, this perspective of the papacy and those who are in, in the Protestant churches who are embracing this idea, it totally mars the beautiful character of God, the character qualities of God. It's an attack on the omnipotence of God. The idea that God can do all things, that's what the, what the word omnipotence means. Here's my question. Doesn't God have almighty power that he would be able to create things instantaneously? Isn't God powerful enough that he can speak and things can come into existence? Yes. The theory of evolution, what it does is it destroys the idea of the all power of God, the omnipotence of God. It's an attack against the omniscience and the wisdom of God. Isn't God wise enough to get things right from the start? that he has to use a process, a long process of death in nature, suffering and cruelty. Isn't God wise enough to make things perfect from the beginning? You know, one scientist wrote this, evolution presents a bloody, ruthless struggle for existence from the very beginning, where there is much waste of living substance and many false starts and blind alleys. Does that sound like a wise God? Where you have a bunch of false starts and blind alleys and much waste of living substance? Can't be. Because when Jesus fed the 5,000, he says, don't let anything go to waste. When he fed the 4,000, he said, pick up everything that's left over. Nothing will go to waste. God is not a God of waste. God is a wise God that makes things right from the beginning. You see the method that the strong survive and the weak disappear is totally against the tenor of the Bible. Because in the Bible it says that God, the strong, helps the weak. And therefore the strong in society must help the weak. Which is what Francis I is preaching but the theory that it embraces goes totally against that grain. Because evolution teaches that the strong are to survive and the weak are to disappear. It is also an attack on the love and mercy of God. How can a God of love use a method where there is so much suffering and cruelty and pain and death? Does this sound like the God who cares for the sparrows, and who dresses the lilies of the field? Does this sound like a loving God? That's not the kind of God that I serve. Furthermore, and this is very important, this scenario also eliminates the need for a redeemer. You see the Bible makes it clear 
that death came in because of sin. And because death came in, we need a redeemer from death. However, if you don't believe the story that Adam and Eve originally sinned, and as a result death came into the world, there was no death before, death comes in because of sin, and because there is death because of sin, you need a redeemer, the result is that you don't need a redeemer. It eliminates the need for a divine redeemer. Let me read you what a Roman Catholic scholar wrote. At least he was being honest. The notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall is nonsense for anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. Did, did you understand what he's writing? He's being brutally honest, but he's right if you believe in the evolutionary theory. The notion of the traditional view of redemption as reconciliation and ransom from the consequences of Adam's fall, well if you don't believe that Adam fell, he says it is nonsense for anyone who knows about the evolutionary background to human existence in the modern world. Frank Lewis Marsh, Adventist scientist, wrote the following, if death and the law of tooth and claw, that's another way of speaking of the survival of the fittest or natural selection, if death and the law of tooth and claw existed long before man, and if man evolved through these natural processes, then there could not have been a perfect Garden of Eden, nor a perfect Adam and Eve, nor could there have been a real fall in which man became subject to sin. If that is so, what is the theological meaning of Jesus' incarnation and atonement? Paul connects the two. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so also by man, one man's obedience many will be made righteous. If there was no Garden of Eden with its tree of life, what is the future that Revelation 22 depicts for the redeemed? Very clear. You see, what we believe about the beginning will definitely impact our belief concerning the end. So the question is, how much longer until the process of evolution reaches its climax, or its omega point, so to speak? Millions of years? Billions? How much of a hope does this give us of an imminent soon coming of Jesus Christ to put an end to the sin and suffering in this world? there would be no, no, not much of a hope. Now I was mentioning this morning that the Roman Catholic Papacy, you know, they celebrate the events of Holy Week every year, Easter every year. Passion Week, you know, Palm Sunday, once a year. They celebrate Ash Wednesday once a year, Good Friday once a year. But when it comes to the resurrection, they say, we need to celebrate the resurrection every week. In spite, in, in, in fact, in spite of the fact that the Bible without exception tells us that the seventh day is God's day of rest, Popes John Paul II and Francis I have said clearly that the Sabbath is a Jewish institution and that the Christian Sabbath is Sunday. They say that the Sabbath is an institution of the old covenant, but we are now under the new covenant. Well, I find it ironic that the Roman Catholic Papacy keeps many of the old covenant things except the Sabbath. They offer sacrifices, they have literal altars, the priests wear literal priestly vestments, they sprinkle holy water, they burn incense, they light candles, and they build shrines to the saints. They say that's all new covenant. But the Sabbath, which is the fourth commandment in God's law, old covenant. Who would want us to believe that the Sabbath is part of the old covenant? Oh, the old devil, folks. Satan hates the Sabbath because the Sabbath reminds us of the Creator. 
it reminds us of Jesus. Every week it keeps fresh in our minds that God created this world in six days and ceased on the seventh day. And it's been that way since creation week. Satan wants people to forget that fact. And therefore he has the papacy institute a rival day which cannot remind people of this. Now let me talk a little bit about the final crisis in this world. You know, as Adventists, we've always said that the final crisis is going to have to do with the seal of God and the mark of the beast. And what we've taught is that the seal of God represents what? The Sabbath. Those who observe the Sabbath in honor of the Creator. The mark of the beast represents what? Knowingly observing Sunday as a day of rest. So basically what we've done as Adventists if, is we've given the impression that the final battle is going to be an issue of days. But there's something deeper than the days. The issue of the days behind the issue of the days is actually the issue of authority. You see, if we keep the Sabbath as the day of rest, whose authority are we accepting? We are accepting God's authority because God created the Sabbath as the sign of His authority. But if we keep Sunday as the day of rest, who was it that established Sunday as the day of rest? The man of sin. So if we observe Sunday, we're recognizing the power or the authority of the entity that claims to have changed the day from Sabbath to Sunday. So behind the issue of the days is which authority stands behind the day. Now in that light, let me just read you some statement by Roman Catholic writers about this issue. They recognize that it's an issue of authority. And they wrote several statements where they, where they actually, uh, you know, they, they talk to Protestants and they say, you Protestants, you know, you say that you go by the Bible, but when you keep Sunday, you're simply accepting the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. They say, we changed it. Let me read you these statements. The first of these statements is found, uh, it's Mon Monsignor Segur, plain talk about Protestantism of today. This is how it reads. It was the Catholic Church which, by the authority of Jesus Christ, that part is wrong, has transferred this rest to the Sunday in remembrance of the resurrection of our Lord. Listen carefully now. Thus the observance of Sunday by Protestants is an homage they pay in spite of themselves to the authority of the Roman Catholic Church. Here's another one. H. Canon Caferata in the book The Catechism Simply Explained. These are Roman Catholic writers. He wrote a word about Sunday. God said, remember that thou keep holy the Sabbath day. The Sabbath was Saturday, not Sunday. Why then do we keep Sunday holy instead of Saturday? He gives the answer. The church altered the observance of the Sabbath to the observance of Sunday. Protestants who say that they go by the Bible and the Bible only, and that they will not believe anything that is not in the Bible, must be rather puzzled by the keeping of Sunday when God said distinctly, keep holy the Sabbath day. The word Sunday does not come anywhere in the Bible. So, listen carefully, without knowing it, they are obeying the authority of the Catholic Church. You notice the word authority again? Here's another one. This is uh, by Father Enright. It was the Holy Catholic Church that changed the day of rest from Saturday to Sunday, the first day of the week. And it not only compelled all to keep Sunday, but urged all persons to labor on the seventh day under pain of anathema. That means under pain of being cursed. Now the writer speaks about Protestants. Protestants profess great reverence for the Bible. And yet by their solemn act of keeping Sunday, they acknowledge the power of the Catholic Church. The Bible says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. But the Catholic Church says, no. Keep the first day of the week. And now notice, and lo, the entire civilized world bows down in reverence obedient 
be obedience to the command of the Holy Catholic Church. Do you know what the problem with Protestantism is? Protestantism was never able to totally break away from the mother. They kept the same day of worship. They kept the idea that the soul is immortal. They kept the idea that hell burns forever. They were never able to totally sever their ties with the mother and that's why they're going to come back to mother. Let me read you this statement. This is an amazing statement. It was written by John O'Brien who for many years taught theology at the University of Notre Dame near Andrews University in South Bend, Indiana. Really significant statement. And by the way, you'll have all these statements if you fill out the card. Everything that I'm presenting, it is written. But since Saturday, not Sunday, is specified in the Bible, isn't it curious that non-Catholics who profess to take their religion directly from the Bible and not from the church observe Sunday instead of Saturday, he asks. Yes, of course it is inconsistent. But this change was made 15 centuries before Protestantism was born. And by that time the custom was universally observed. They, that is Protestants, have continued the custom even though it rests upon the authority of the Catholic Church and not upon an explicit text in the Bible. And now comes the key portion. That observance remains as a reminder of the Mother Church from which the non-Catholic sects broke away. Like a boy running away from home but still carrying in his pocket a picture of his mother or a lock of her hair. Never able to sever itself from mom. And therefore they will come back to mommy. And we are seeing it today. We're seeing it very clearly. A return of Protestants, Protestants to Roman Catholicism. Now, Let's talk a little, little about the Seventh-day Adventist church. God has raised up this church for a time such as this. Let me give you a little bit of history. September 26, 1860, in Battle Creek, Michigan, a commission of several men of the church gathered together to decide what name they would give to this movement, the Seventh-day Adventist movement that was actually born around 1844. By 1860 it had grown into a body of believers. They said it's time for us to give this body of believers a name. Three individuals were very prominent in this committee, J. N. Loughborough, Brother Hewitt, and Brother Poole. Some individuals that were gathered there suggested that the name of this group of believers should be the Church of God. To which Elder Loughborough objected. He said, you know, everybody claims that their church is the church of God. There's nothing distinctive about that. So after much discussion, Brother Poole made the following, following motion. Resolved that we call ourselves Seventh-day Adventists. There was only one dissenting vote. The original pastor that had suggested that the name should be the church of God. On October 23, 1860, just a few days later, in the Review and Herald, page 179, the explanation of the adoption of the name was given. This is the explanation. The name Seventh-day Adventists was proposed as a simple name and one expressive of our faith and position. Have you ever given thought to the name Seventh-day Adventist Church? You know, there's some Adventist churches that are wanting to hide the Seventh-day Adventist part. You know, they call themselves Adventist Community Church or Adventist Fellowship. Some have even eliminated the, the word Adventist. It's just a community church wanting to hide the special identity of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. The fact is, folks, that our name was chosen providentially for a special purpose for a time such as this. If you look at the three angels' message, it begins in the first message calling people to worship the Creator, and as soon as the third message has ended, Jesus is sitting on a cloud coming to harvest the earth. 
It begins with creation and it ends with the second coming of Jesus Christ and everything in between. Seventh-day Adventist means that we believe in a literal creation. Seventh-day Adventist. We believe that the days of creation were literal, that God ceased on the seventh day, and we are to follow the example. We believe in a quick beginning, just like the Bible says. And the name Seventh-day Adventist believes, uh, teaches that we believe also in a supernatural quick beginning end to human history with the second coming of Jesus Christ to repair all of the things that are happening in this world. If that isn't the message that the world needs now, I don't know what message the world needs. Incidentally, Ellen White wrote about the adoption of the name. It's a rather lengthy statement, but it's very important, so I'm going to read it. It's in Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, pages 223 and 224. The name chosen was providentially chosen. This is what she wrote. I was shown in regard to the remnant people of God taking a name. Two classes were presented before me. One class embraced the great bodies of professed Christians. They were trampling upon God's law and bowing to a papal institution. They were keeping the first day of the week as the Sabbath of the Lord. The other class, who were but few in number, were bowing to the great lawgiver. They were keeping the fourth commandment. The peculiar and prominent features of their faith were the observance of the seventh day and waiting for the appearing of our Lord from heaven. The conflict is between the requirements of God and the requirements of the beast. The first day a papal institution that directly contradicts the fourth commandment is yet to be made a test by the two-horned beast, which is the United States. And then the fearful warning from God declares the penalty of bowing to the beast and his image. They shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. No name which we can take will be appropriate but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as a peculiar people. We don't want to be peculiar today. We feel peer pressure. We want to be just like everybody else. But she says, no name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and marks us as peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist is a standing rebuke to the Protestant world. Here is the line of distinction between the worshipers of God and those who worship the beast and receive his marks. The great conflict is between the commandments of God and the requirements of the beast. It is because the saints are keeping all ten of the commandments that the dragon makes war upon them. If they will lower the standard and yield the peculiarities of their faith, the dragon will be at peace. But they excite his ire because they have dared to raise the standard and unfurl their banner in opposition to the Protestant world who are worshiping the institution of the papacy. The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will convict the inquiring mind. Like an arrow from the Lord's quiver, it will wound the transgressors of God's law and will lead to repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our name is not simply a name that was chosen by a committee. Ellen White tells us that the name was providentially chosen. God guided the minds of those who were gathered together to adopt the name Seventh-day Adventists. Ellen White concludes this statement by writing, I was shown that almost every fanatic who has risen, who wishes to hide his sentiments that he may lead others astray, claims to belong to the church of God. Such a name would at once excite suspicion, for it is employed to conceal the most absurd errors. This name is too indefinite for the remnant people of God. It would lead to the supposition that we had a faith which we wished to cover up. And then Ellen White predicted in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 144, that the day would come when some in our own church would attempt to 
demean the importance of our name. And I'm going to read her statement because, you know, I'm being critical of the individuals who want to do this. I'm not being critical of the remnant church. This is God's remnant church. With all its defects and all its weaknesses, it is God's remnant church. And by the way, there's little groups that are not in harmony with everything that happens in the church, and I'm not in harmony with everything that happens either. And they go off and they form a little splinter group. Do you think that little, little splinter, group is, is splinter group is going to finish the work on earth? No. Let me tell you why God established the Seventh-day Adventist organization. Not an end in itself. God established the organization of the Adventist church to plant Seventh-day Adventist believers on any at every country on planet earth. So that when crunch time comes, God will have a witness in every country of the world. Organization makes that possible. In other words, organization is functional. God, through organization, through unions and conferences and divisions, has wanted to plant the truth everywhere in the world. For that we need organization. That doesn't mean that the organization is going to go through to the end. We know that when people can't buy or sell, the organization is going to have to shut its doors. How can it function if you can't buy or sell? If there's a death decree. But while we are able, God wants the organization to be used to plant believers everywhere on planet earth. So that when crunch time comes, God will have a witness everywhere on planet earth. That is the purpose of organization. So don't go off with some little group that says, oh, you know, I don't, I don't like what the Adventist church teaches about this or that. Let's hang in there with the church. In spite of all the problems that the church has, you know, there is no other church in the world that God has called to fulfill his mission. This is the church. Hang in there. Don't embrace the things that are happening that are wrong. But don't leave and go someplace else and form a splinter group. Testimonies, volume 6, page 144, Ellen White wrote, Men will employ every means to make less prominence the difference between Seventh-day Adventists and observers of the first day of the week. A company was, now listen carefully, you might say, well, you know, that's uh, the, the non-Adventists that want to make us less prominent. No, no, no. A company was presented before me under the name of Seventh-day Adventists who were advising that the banner or sign which makes us a distinct people should not be held out so strikingly. For they claimed that this was not the best policy in order to secure the success of our institutions. However, this is not a time to haul down our colors, to be ashamed of our faith. This distinctive banner, described in the words, here is the patience of the saints, here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus, is to be borne through the world to the close of probation. While efforts should be increased to advance in different localities, there must be no cloaking of our faith to secure patronage. Truth must come to souls ready to perish, and if it is in any way hidden, God is dishonored, and the blood of souls will be upon our garments. Pretty clear, isn't it? Now, the Lord is working in marvelous ways. Let me just tell you a story in ending. Uh, earlier this year, in the month of February, I was invited to present a series of meetings at a Spanish church in Riverside, California, near Loma Linda University. You know, I, I, I preached there, uh, finally the, the Sabbath came, and uh, there was a family that came on that Sabbath, it was a husband and wife and three children. And, um, you know, I greeted them at the door and, uh, you know, bid them farewell until the afternoon meeting. And after they left, the pastor of the church came up to me and says, uh, did they tell you their story? I said, no, they haven't told me their story. What, is there a story to tell? He said, yeah, none of those uh, members of that family are Seventh-day Adventists. I said, really? So what is the story? He says, well, it just so happens that the, the husband had been checking the internet because he was convicted that the Sabbath was a day of rest. He had been reading his Bible 
The conviction was there, so he said, I'm going to go to the internet, I'm going to see if I find uh, anything else having to do with Sabbath observance. So he went to the internet, and he discovered many resources of not only Adventist churches, but other churches that are keeping the Sabbath today. And so then he discovered, as he was researching the internet, uh, the materials from Secrets Unsealed. And so he watched the entire Cracking the Genesis Code, 52 hours of programming. When it ended, he said, there's no doubt whatsoever that the Seventh-day Adventist Church has the truth concerning the Sabbath. So he said to his daughter, you know, go and see if you can find out on the internet uh, where there is a Seventh-day Adventist Church uh, so that we can go to church next Sabbath. So his daughter went and she found many, many churches in Southern California. There's dozens of churches. But what church do you suppose she found? The Riverside Spanish Church. And it just so happens that on that Sabbath, I was preaching at that church. When they came back in the afternoon, I told them, uh, you know, why didn't you tell me your story? They said, well, you know, there were other people around you and you were hugging them and you were saying hello and, and you know, we didn't feel like we would do it at that time. A most amazing story. Do you know that there are thousands of people out there that go through the same experience? They're searching for the truth. And who's going to give them the truth? God is going to give them the truth, sometimes in unorthodox ways. You take, for example, ministries such as Amazing Facts or Secrets Unsealed or, or other ministries. Only eternity will show how many people came into the Seventh-day Adventist Church as a result of these ministries. And they're actually, I hate it when people call them independent organizations. I hate the word independent. Because really they are supporting ministries of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And it's a great advantage to the denomination. You say, why is that? Because the organized work does not put, put one single penny into the functioning of those ministries. And yet those ministries are bringing thousands into the Seventh-day Adventist Church at no cost to the organization. Praise the Lord. The organization can spend the money on other things to reach individuals. So we're in this all together. In other words, we need to use every means possible in all of the world, with all groups possible, to just try and finish this work so that we can go home. Are you pretty comfortable here in Calgary? Are you comfortable enough that you say, well, you know, I have a nice house, I got a nice car, and you know, I got some money in the bank, and some pretty nice clothes, and lots of good friends, and life ain't bad. Is that the way you feel? Folks, it's time to go home. Not our home here. <laughs> it's time to go home. It's time to go to our heavenly home. God is waiting on us. God could have finished the work in an instant. He's waiting on us to get off the pews and to go out and share this marvelous message that God has given, that God is a God of love. He created the world in six days, rested on the seventh day, and gave us a sign of his love that will last throughout eternity, the Holy Sabbath. An entire day, folks, when we can just uh, separate from everything secular that we do and dedicate it only to sacred activities related to the Lord. What a wonderful thing. God not only gives us things, God gives us time. Is time more important than things? Absolutely. If you don't believe that, ask your children. You know, lots of parents never spend time with their kids. The kids grow up, they leave the church, they leave home. Say, my dad and my mom, they were never there. But God not only gives us wonderful things, God also gives us 24 hours of his time. What a marvelous experience. Let me just tell you, I, I, I didn't have planned telling this story, but... Let me just tell you this story in a couple, two or three minutes. You know, the Christian world generally says that the Sabbath is a yoke of bondage. Have you heard that before? Oh, keeping the Sabbath, that's legalistic. So you can't go to the supermarket, you can't watch television. Oh, that is so, so terrible. Now let me tell you a story about the college where I went to school. I went to school, did my first three years of theology 
in Medellin, Colombia. That's where I met my wife. My wife is Colombian. And uh, when I attended that school, it was very extremely conservative. The boys sat on one side of the auditorium and the girls sat on the other side. And there was a side of campus that was for the boys and another side was for the girls. And woe to a boy that went to the girls' side or vice versa. You would be reprimand, reprimanded and you would be disciplined. But for those uh, students who formalized their, their friendship, you know both parents had to be consulted, every two weeks they could go to a teacher's or faculty's home and spend two hours together at the faculty's house behind a curtain, not a solid wall, a curtain. <laughs> it was a marvelous experience. I had that experience with my wife every two weeks. We would go to this place and you know we'd have two whole hours to spend together and to talk to the other, enjoy each other's company. The rest of the time, segregation. <laughs> By the way, I also had the privilege of, um, of seeing other students go through this experience because later at the same university I was a teacher and I had students come to our house and experience this. Do you suppose that uh, when, uh, when the time for the date was coming, that I would say, bummer. I have to spend two whole hours with her. Ah, oh, what torture. What a yoke of bondage. Are you kidding? I always got there early. <laughs> and when the time was coming to an end, you know, we, we'd gather at the door and talk with the teacher and everything. We were actually buying time after the time that we were supposed to end. It wasn't a yoke of bondage. Spending two whole hours together every two weeks, what a privilege. One time while I was teaching, there was this couple that would come to our house. And uh, it was their turn on that particular day. And the girl comes to our house, she's by herself, and she's crying her eyes out. She says, Pastor Bohr, she could hardly be consoled. Oh, Pastor Bohr, I feel so bad. I said, what's wrong? She says, well, you know, this is the time when I'm supposed to come here with my boyfriend. And you know what? He decided that he would go with his friends and play soccer instead of coming. What should I do? I said, get rid of him. <laughs> because if he prefers to play soccer, rather than being with you, especially when it takes place every two weeks, imagine what's going to happen after you get married. Are you following me? The Sabbath is our time with Jesus. And if anything on the Sabbath, like shopping and television and worldly music and, and worldly entertainment, is more important than spending time with Jesus, you have troubles in your relationship with the Lord. So it's all about spending the day with Jesus and remembering how wonderful He is. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your holy Sabbath. Thank you for giving us not only things, material things, thank you for giving us time quality time. Thank you that we're able every week, once a week, at the end of the week, to just unwind, get rid of all our anxieties and all of our pains and sorrows, and focus only on you, our wonderful God. Lord, help us to have this glorious experience of Sabbath observance. We know that very soon, those who keep the Sabbath will be proscribed by society will be persecuted. Even a death decree will be uttered against the faithful. But Lord, help us to understand that spending that time with Jesus is more important than life itself because we love Jesus. Thank you, Father, for having been with us, for answering our prayer, for we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, I think we're going to take a break now. And... Um, We'll receive our instructions and then we'll come for our final English presentation. For those of you who would like to brush up on your Spanish, 
7 o'clock this evening, we, I will be speaking in Spanish, the language of heaven. <laughs> People think about uh, 